welcome to Pause for Payments. I am Christy Duncan, and I am so excited to have an expert today with me in international trade development, Damali Sasali. Damali is an international trade development expert and is based in Kampala. Welcome, Damali. Thank you, Christy. Today, we're gonna to talk about giving others a platform, which can also create a platform for your own personal brand. And Damali has been an absolute role model in this. She's done this for the last little while, and we're gonna hear about this in today's discussion. Damali, can you tell our audience about your role in international trade and how that connects with the world of payment and tax? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Christy, actually, for also for that introduction. Going back to my role in international trade is specifically trade facilitation. Uh, in simple terms, it means uh, unblocking the bottlenecks that hinder the smooth flow of goods and services across countries and continents. And there are two components to international trade. That is formal trade and informal trade, which are both equally important. So formal trade is very impor important. There's a lot of literature around it and there's formal structures set up to facilitate formal trade, like the World Trade Organization, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area, all frameworks set up within which to support the movement of goods and services across countries uh, in a formal way. And then, uh, so formal trade is very visible. There are policies and procedures around it. The experts who are continually working towards perfecting this flow of goods and services. However, informal trade, on the other hand, is almost invisible. There is no comparative structure to facilitate informal trade. And yet for me, this is very, very important in the aspect of reducing poverty through trade. Uh, we will never be able to actually trade ourselves out of poverty unless informal trade is fully facilitated to scale and to grow. Take, for example, Uganda in 2019 alone, Uganda's informal traders exported goods worth $530 million to the Democratic Republic of Congo, to South Sudan, and Kenya. The most exported goods were agricultural produce, that is maize, beans, sugar, horticulture. And get this, 70% of the people involved in informal cross-border trade are women. Uh, it is also a known fact that, uh, and several studies have shown that in fact, that when a woman has a disposable income, she reinvests 60% of it back into the business and then uses around 40% to feed her children, uh, take care of their health, and then take them to school. So that's what our informal traders are using this in extra income for, for the welfare of their family and therefore the social welfare of the country. Unfortunately, informal cross-border traders face a multitude of challenges. And I'm going to give you the top three. First one is a lack of access to finance. So they cannot scale their trade business. You find a woman who has been in informal trade for 20 years and she still has the same amount of capital because she can't access finance. She has no collateral. She can't scale. She can't grow. What she's doing is profitable enough to keep maybe her family fed and her child, you know, free of malaria, but she can't grow beyond that. So she stays small for forever. Second uh, major problem is uh, physical and sexual harassment. As they try to export their goods across the border, even to get their payments, they're physically harassed, they're sexually harassed. And it's, it's, it's the norm, that's what happens and they live with it. Then the third major problem is their inability to access uh, information in their local languages. So a lot of these trade uh, policies and processes are all very uh, formal. They are written in English, if even, even if you can read English, the language is so verbose, it's so legalistic. So you may not even be able to understand it if you're lucky enough to actually be able to, to read English. Most of them don't, but this information is not provided in their local languages. And I see all these problems as problems that can be solved by technology, by FinTech solutions. And to ensure that actually informal trade you know, can actually work and uh, be able to contribute to the social welfare of all these people. Uh, but this can only happen when, if informal trade is made visible. A lot of people think of trade mostly in the formal ways and they ignore this huge component of informal trade, despite these numbers that I've talked about, $550 million worth of stuff exported in one year, contributing to the export uh, value, export revenue of the country. So I do have a dream like Martin Luther King, I have a dream that one day we will have a payments and fintech solution that 
and a platform that is info for informal cross-border trade in the context within which they work. I'm looking for a platform that uh, an informal cross-border trader with a feature phone, because in Uganda only we have 37% internet penetration. So most people, informal traders use feature phones. So I'm looking, my dream is a FinTech platform for informal cross-border trade, where a woman trader with a feature phone can access cheap, affordable credit finance to expand their business to scale. The same solution should enable her to access buyers across the, 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 the border while she's physically in Uganda, figure out and um, find out what they need, maybe maize in the quantities they need, and then allow her to contact that buyer, make the sale, receive her money and mobile money while she's sitting in Uganda, not putting herself at any physical uh, risk, and then also have a logistic services within that solution that can come pick her stuff, consolidate it maybe with other informal cross-border traders, and then export it and then take it, deliver it to Kenya or DRC without her moving an inch from Uganda. Therefore, she doesn't have to physically be you know, harassed. She doesn't need to move. Her cash is available and she already has access to finance. The other company that I would like in the platform would uh, allow them to access information on trade rules, trade procedures, trade regulations in their local language, whatever that language is, that they can access that information. And I believe that if this is done, it, uh, we will guarantee an increase in disposable income and conversely a reduction to poverty because these ladies will now have a higher disposable income and therefore better able to uh, look after their kids, feed them, educate them, and maybe go beyond just the basic necessities of food, education, you know, and health, and maybe start living even a better life. So for me, I feel that that, that, that would be my dream of an informal cross-border trade platform that allows this. And it's only technology that can actually get us there. But it will only be done if, it's, if informal trade is made visible. And I feel at this point, it's not yet visible to people who are developing these solutions, who are you know, leveraging technology to solve a lot of the world's problems. Wow, this is fantastic, Damal. You've really put a lot of thought into this and your expertise and experience really helps to inform this potential new app, if you will. Uh, I think surely someone in our audience should be able to help you, but we'll, we'll keep our fingers crossed on that one. So thank you for that, Damali. This is really interesting. And I'm sure one of our audience must be able to help us devise this fintech solution that has all these things that you've you've identified are really critical to help promote uh, informal, informal cross-border trade and address some of these challenges that some of the women face and thereby help us to uh, enable them and to build their businesses in, in safety and uh, support their families. I think by now, I certainly noticed and our audience will have noticed that you've got this amazing energy and it's so infectious and, and you've got this great uh, smile that just uh, lights up the room. But I also know that you run and started this Damali Sally Ideation Corner. And I love it. And I want you to tell the audience a little bit about more about what it's all about and, uh, and uh, why it's important for what you do. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad that you <laughs> you watched the Ideation Corner. So um, the Ideation Corner, it's a hobby of mine. So I, I don't do it full time. Right? It's, a, it's something I do on the weekend, actually. And uh, so it's my passion. And it came about uh, for two reasons. Uh, first, uh, for some unknown reason, I feel the need to inspire young, young people to become greater than what they are, to become greater than the environment that they're in, to go out there and start to achieve their dreams. Young people always have a lot of dreams. So I want to inspire them to achieve those, uh, those particular dreams. And that's why I wanted this particular platform. The second uh, reason is I wanted to showcase Ugandans who have indeed done something, who have run after their dreams, who have, despite the challenges to entrepreneurship in our country, are still working towards achieving those dreams. Uh, interestingly, uh, both my parents were entrepreneurs. 
my father uh, uh, is a chartered quantity surveyor, and until his retirement, he was self-employed, uh, running his own farm, providing surveying services to people. And then uh, my mother uh, was a modern day gynecologist. So she was self-employed. She ran her own maternity clinic where they delivered babies on a daily. I mean, she could deliver maybe three babies in a day. <laughs> Uganda is a very fertile country. So both my parents <laughs> were entrepreneurs. <laughs> But uh, though clearly I haven't followed in my parents' footsteps, I'm not necessarily uh, an entrepreneur. I wanted the ideation corner to create a platform to appreciate those people who to me are actually local heroes because they've come out and done something in this environment, whichever it is. And I wanted the young people to see someone who looks like them, who is Ugandan, who went to the same school they went to, who grew up in the same local environment they grew up in, who has the same limitations to capital like they do, who has still trying to do something so that they can aspire to either become like them or even be greater than them. So I wanted them to have local examples. You know, a lot of our young Ugandans, when you, you talk about them about entrepreneurship, whether they're thinking or dreaming, they'll tell you about Jack Ma of Alibaba, Jeff Bezos of Amazon, Aliko Dangote of the Dangote conglomerate. And then they get this mental block because they feel like they can't even start because they don't have the opportunities that those people do. But they're using the wrong examples. Those examples, I mean, they're great to definitely aspire to, but they're not great for you to just start. Because if you look at them to start, you won't start because there's so many challenges you look at and say, you know what, uh, you know, they have all these opportunities done. Gote comes from a rich family. Jeff Bezos, you know, you know, has capital. He's in the Western world. You know, Jack Ma, you know, God knows that, you know, Chinese government supported him. So you, you immediately say, you know what, I can't even begin. So I wanted to give them examples that look like them. This is a Ugandan. She went to the same school that you did. She went to the same university that you did. Her parents are right there and she's done something. So maybe you can start there. So, um, um, and so the, 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 the showcase for, for me on the ideation platform was fine, maybe these are not Jeff Bezos that I'm showcasing, but at least maybe one day they will become Jeff Bezos of Africa. <laughs> Or maybe they will inspire someone to become the Jeff Bezos of Africa or the Dan Gote of Uganda. So, <laughs> and here's the thing, Uganda has one of the youngest populations in the world. 75% of the people in Uganda are below 35 years old. And also our employment rate is very low. Out of every 10 Ugandans who are employable, only four Ugandans actually have jobs. This means that we have to work hard to ensure that the Ugandans who are employable are able to create their own jobs because there is not enough employment opportunities out there for all of them. Then uh, also, luckily, Uganda is also consistently ranked as one of the most entrepreneurial countries in the world. However, most businesses in Uganda die within two years of being registered or set up. So they're dying very young. Uh, so my platform on the, on the ideation corner is to basically provide a platform, showcase those who are thriving so that they can share their insights on how are they able to do it? How are they able to jump over this, this issue of dying after two years and of lack of capital, you know, working in a very difficult entrepreneurial environment so that then the young people can also maybe learn from them and do, do something, start something. And I hope that the entire hope of the ideation is to inspire them and motivate them to, to, to implement whatever their dreams are, but at least to start somewhere and not get these mental blocks of, of seeing the very successful people who are outside our environment, who they can't get to, and therefore stopping to even begin to dream or they even kill their dreams because they're, what they're aspiring to is too high and they can't see a practical example on how to, to implement the say dream. Wow, such a, a insightful leadership you've taken to Mali to really give a platform for people to learn and find role models who look like them. You can't be what you can't see and you need to be able to see these people as as approachable and relatable to them and you know in many ways like them not like Jack Ma or Jeff Bezos <laughs> on the other side of the world. And uh, by doing that, I think you also created a, a platform that uh, allows these, you know, gives a, a showcase, a, a spotlight to these amazing leaders, but it also gives a spotlight to you and gives you a voice and some, some power, if you will, 
a little bit like Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> <laughs> He's always chatting with interesting people and giving them a, a platform. So I think that's really important. But tell me, um, tell us about the opportunities and challenges that are faced by women in the payments and the fintech industry who may um, be similar to women in, in our audience from women in payments. So um, I, early, early this year, the High People Foundation, I think it was March or April, held a 40 Days 40 Fintech uh, Summit, in which they indicated that only 10% of Ugandan fintechs are either led by or owned by women. This is despite the fact that uh, in Uganda, women, we are the majority. We, may, we actually make up 51% of the population. And... Uh, Though this disparity in, in representation in the fintech sector is uh, concerning, it's, it, it, it's across mostly all sectors really in Uganda. There's a, dis, you know, there's a misrepresentation really. We are, we are less than we should be when we are the majority of the population. But for me, it's actually more concerning in the fintech uh, sector. And this is because technology has been, has shown that it is really the thing that we can leverage to take people out of poverty, to touch those people who are at the bottom of the pyramid. And if we don't have enough women developing those solutions in leadership positions in those positions, it means that the solutions, fintech solutions that we're developing or solutions to do with technology we're developing in Uganda to address the problems affecting Uganda are really not going to tackle those problems that really affect women who are at the bottom of the pyramid, i.e. healthcare, education, access to finance, access to information, something as, in, as simple as information because we don't have the women in this uh, technology space so for me i i i find that the main reason also for that uh, for that lack of representation really in the fintech space is that uh ugandan women do not have access to finance even those in the corporate world we don't have access to finance even those in smes the business owners do not have access to finance uh, there was a study that showed in uganda that the ugandan banks traditional banks lend less than 1% to Ugandan in women entrepreneurs. Less than 1% of their entire loan book goes to Ugandan women entrepreneurs. This is because they require the entrepreneur who wants a loan to give them collateral in the form of a land title. We work, uh, we are in a paternal society. So there are very few women, women who have land, who have a land title and women do not inherit land. So the men can inherit land, so they can inherit a land title, which then they can take to the bank and then get you know, financing. The women, on the other hand, you really can't inherit land, so you can't inherit a land title. I may have worked and therefore bought land and maybe now have a land title, but there'll be very few of those women who can actually afford to have land and the land title. So less than 1% of, of the bank loan actually goes to uh, women entrepreneurs in Uganda. The crazy thing is also that Ugandan women entrepreneurs are one of the most entrepreneurial in the world. 48% of all small and medium-sized businesses actually in Uganda are by women, 48%. So we dominate, we are actually quite entrepreneurial despite our lack of finance. So you can imagine if the women in FinTech had access to finance, the women who are you know, developing these technologies had access to finance so that they can actually develop these solutions that have a real impact on real people who are at the bottom of the pyramid to solve those problems. Because it's very difficult for a man to really conceptualize this woman deep in the village in somewhere in Uganda who needs just a solar light so that her child can study at night for them to develop that kind of solution. And yet I, as a woman, can think about it. This woman who may need just very little credit to buy malaria medicine for her child and then develop a solution that can even allow that tablet to be delivered to her where she is in time, in real time. So unless we get our women, uh, Ugandan women who are incredibly entrepreneurial, incredibly talented, if, unless we get them a certain amount of capital to, for them to grow and scale and then run and own these businesses that develop 
these solutions, it will be difficult for us to really uh, develop solutions that have a real impact. We'll continue to develop solutions that, you know, are for the elite, for the people with Android phones, for the people with, you know, who you can, you know, charge a service fee, because, you know, those are the people who are dominating the development. But if we have women in there, for me, it doesn't matter that I'm a female and I can afford an Android phone and I can afford, you know, the expensive applications and solutions. I still worry in my head, I still worry about that woman deep in the village whose child will die of malaria just because she can't afford tablets that day. So I still, if I was a developer, I would develop a solution that actually addresses that. Not, not because of profit, but because I feel like I need to because I can connect to her. Because when I go to my village, I see those women and they touch me because I can see she can't afford to actually feed her child because she may not have credit to buy something so simple today. So insightful, Damali. Um, it sounds like you should be in the policy area to help <laughs> uh, you know, put in stimulus measures to help develop the economy and, and the, some of these tools that could really help women to bring up the standard of living and the, um, for not only themselves and their families, but Ugandans and, and the country on, on the whole. So, thank you for shedding light on some of these challenges. Thanks. Uh, it's really important, and I'm so glad that the women of Uganda have you as a big uh, supporter and leader to help shine the light. I want to close this discussion today, Damali, by talking a little bit about your amazing career. And you've got these, you know, very inspiring entrepreneurial parents and and you're working in this international trade and you see all of these challenges that you're doing a lot to really shine a spotlight on and raise the profile of and, and uh, help to find solutions for. Can you tell us what advice would you have for women who want to build a career in business or perhaps looking for new opportunities in today's environment? What would you tell your 30 year old self? Ah, that's a good one. <laughs> Cause I think about it all the time. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I wish I knew this. I wish I knew this. Every time I find out something, I'm like, I wish I knew this five years ago. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, thank you. And I'm still, I'm, I feel like I'm still building my career. I feel like I still, I still don't know where I'm supposed to be going and I still have a lot to do. But there are several things that I would love, have loved, you know, my you know, young you know, self to, to have known, they would have taken me a lot, you know, maybe further. So, uh, and I have maybe three major lessons to share, i.e. Uh, you have to master your craft and while at it, be visible and build your brand at the same time. So whatever you're doing, if you're running your own business or you're in employment, become an expert in your field, attend webinars, uh, read content, develop content, learn as you go along. It's important to keep learning continuously. So continuous learning is key. I was listening or reading something recently from Hillary Clinton, and she said, and I paraphrase, that people are always amazed at how wonderful Obama, President Obama and President Clinton are at giving speeches, at engaging the crowd when they're with the crowds, and, uh, and how it comes up also natural uh, for them. And she said that she can testify. She's married to one of them. She's worked for one of them and she can testify that they work hard and prepare, prepare and prepare for each and every engagement. So they work hard at that thing that we think comes off so natural. So we have to also continuously prepare to become good at what we are. We have to every day master our craft, our craft. And most important also equally is to write about it, talk about it, share with people about it. As women, we are so fond of doing a lot of work and knowing, you know, being very good actually at, at, at what we do, no, having knowledge in our heads about the work we do. But then we don't, we never share that knowledge. Our, maybe the people we work with closely, no, just damnly knows her stuff. She writes the best reports. She, you know, she's amazing. She knows all these things. She's always giving wonderful insights in meetings, but then no one knows about Damali outside, you know, this meeting. No one knows about Damali outside the organization, even outside the people I share my reports with. We have to be better than that. We have to learn to share our knowledge beyond our organization, beyond our small circle. We have to share it 
across the world, we have these wonderful tools at our fingertips. We have the internet, we have so many platforms within which we, we have to share it. So we have to join the social media platforms and engage in a manner that is comfortable and authentic to you. Do, do, do not copy someone else. Do not, do not see Damali doing this, this and that and say, oh, me too, I'm going to do that. No, no, no. Find out what you're comfortable with and then do that. Be authentic and be unique. So whatever you're good at is something Damali is not good at. So do what you're good at. And whatever Damali is good at may not be something that you're good at or comfortable in. So you, and you should be really, really authentic. The second message would be uh, surround yourself with the right people. And this is very important. Uh, it is said that you become the total sum of the five people you spend most of your time with. For example, when I had this idea to, to, to start the ideation corner, I, I had had this idea in my head for one year and I hadn't shared it with anyone until February 2020 when I was hanging around with a very good friend of mine and I told her that, you know what, I've been thinking about setting up this thing called the ideation corner. And she immediately said, Jamali, that is fantastic. You should do it. And she kept chasing me to, to follow up to see, so what are you doing? What are you doing? And the beauty of our time today, we live in the digital world. If you don't have these wonderful people around you, that's okay. Go online, go on YouTube and find people who are great, who talk about these things, who you know inform you and uh, motivate you. They are all there. They're on YouTube. You can listen to podcasts. You can watch YouTube people who are motivators. I mean, don't take everything they say. Of course, you have to sift through the things they say and pick those things that resonate with you. But there's no excuse to say, yeah, I don't have people around me who motivate me, who inspire me, who, you know, develop my mind. Go online on YouTube and find all those motivators who are sharing content for free. Okay, you, you need you, you need internet access. But most of the people that I'm talking to right now actually do have internet access. So go online and do that. Listen to podcasts that build your brain and your mind. Spend more time there to develop your brain and your mind so that you can become, you know, the total sum of the whatever people you've been listening to on YouTube or listening to podcasts. Last week, I was watching uh, YouTube, listening to one of those inspirational people, and I stumbled upon a lady who was talking about this five-second rule. And uh, she said that our brains are wired in a way that th th they want to comfort. So they prefer you eating, resting, or chilling, because we are still animals. If you look at a lion, all they do is eat, sleep, play. So our brains naturally, by default, we are defaulted that way, that our brain will be happy when we are eating, sleeping, chilling. So whenever you, you have a task to do, the brain will convince you that, yeah, I do it tomorrow. Oh, you know, put it off. And, you know, so she has this five second rule where she counts five, four, three, two, one, and then gets to do the task that she has to do because it forces her brain not to think because the brain is thinking about counting down to one. So it doesn't stop to convince you to not do the task you're supposed to do. I am a great procrastinator, by the way. I, I always put up things and I do them last minute when I have to. So this five second rule, I'm trying to practice it. I only learned about it last week and sometimes I forget to do it. But the few times I've remembered to do it, I've actually gotten on and done the thing, I, I, the task at hand that I have to do. Uh, I can't see point. you getting at anything. You have so much energy. <laughs> Oh, procrastinator, seriously. <laughs> Maybe I could have done a whole lot more if I wasn't. Oh, I, <laughs> I cannot believe that. But anyway, you, you, you cover it well, you hide it well. My last, my, my last one point, and this is important, is that you know how we spend about 23 years of our lives studying at school to become these professionals, but then we never study the, the, you know, the, the school of life. How do you live a life that is happy, that is content, that is fulfilled? We never study that. And that generally is philosophy. So I was reading or watching something. I get all these insights somewhere. So I was reading something, I think. And, I, and there was a nurse whose job for the last 30 years has been to look after terminally ill patients. And she said all of them, their two regrets have always been uh, them not pursuing their dreams and not spending time with their family. Those were the consistent regrets that they had from her work with terminally ill patients. So um, in the study of life also, another friend of mine uh, about four months ago introduced me to this concept of stoicism. And one of the few things I've picked up in that entire concept is that it is not that we don't have enough time throughout our lifetime. It is that we don't use the time we have 
for the important things in life that is pursuing our dreams and also spending time with our family. And if you think about it, we have 168 hours in one week. And if we spend eight hours, we are recommended to sleep eight hours uh, per night. We, we spend 56 hours of that 168 sleeping. Then if we have a job or a business, we spend around 40 hours doing the job, the business, Monday to Friday, eight hours a day. So we are left with 72 hours a week to put on the two important things, i.e. family and pursuing your dreams. 72 hours is actually a total of three days in a week. That's a lot of time if we use it well. So I think if we can manage that, I'm trying to do that now. I'm, I'm, I'm trying it out for like a, a space of one year. I want to try it out where I use 72 hours of my week time to follow my dreams, spend time with my family. And hopefully at the end of it all, I'll be having a happy, fulfilled life. So the concept in stoicism is that it's not like we don't have enough time. We do have enough time actually in our life. It's just that the time we have, we are not using it for the important things in life, which at the end we will regret. So we have to focus on them now, i.e. find time to pursue your dream, find time to you know, spend time with your family, and then you will live a happy, fulfilled life. But major, major message here is that while we spend so much time to become professionals, we should spend time learning how to live life. <laughs> That's it. You, you should be a philosopher. <laughs> Never mind. Entrepreneur. <laughs> um, your, your thoughts are very, very um, down to earth, Damali. They're really focusing on what is important in life. It's not about building a big business. It's about quality of life and, and raising people up to you know, standards to be able to educate their families, their children, and and nourish them and have a standard of living that is, you know, very, in, you know, enjoyable, but also pursuing our dreams and uh, supporting our families. So those are all really, really important. And I think you're right, we do sometimes lose sight of them. Um, perhaps during this pandemic, we'll have more time to spend at home with our families and and support them and educate them one way or another they don't drive us crazy first <laughs> <laughs> i do have a lot of colleagues who are like i'm going nuts in this pandemic <laughs> the family is too much <laughs> yes yes well i mean everybody has their story and everybody you know is in a different situation and i do feel for the women who now are not only you know doing their jobs but they're also become teachers for you know however many kids they may have at home and that's not easy so. no it isn't actually and in in a way well, well, i was reading something where it was the pandemic oh yes it's it's definitely bad but it's given us a time to pause ha, pause for payments to pause in life and see reassess is, is this the right way to go? I mean, is the way we are living, the way we are working, the right way to work, is it good enough that we are always, always, always so busy? We are like, you know, in this rat race and not stopping and, you know, even enjoying the, you know, the sunset. So maybe we can start reassessing how we should be, you know, living our lives and, and finding a way to, to balance them. So you're at work Monday to Friday, you know, nine to five, and then you don't get a minute to actually enjoy the life you for which income you're working so hard to actually get it's very true it's very true tamale this has been a fabulous discussion thank you so much i've learned so much i love your career insights about becoming an expert and surrounding yourself with amazing people the right people whether they are face-to-face -face or online people that <laughs> inspire you <laughs> And also pursuing your dreams. That's that's really important because we don't want to get to our deathbed and, and have regrets like that because, you know, then there's there's no more time to it's do that. It's too late. Yeah. It's too late, indeed. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Christy. I'm so glad you invited me. I was like, when, when, when you sent the email, I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to be on post for payments. <laughs> yeah, well, we are so excited. I'm going to encourage all of our audience to join us online for this, as well as other Pause for Payments webinars. We've got uh, weekly discussions with amazing women from around the world. Uh, Damali is one of them, clearly. 
and uh, we can get inspiration from them. So thanks everybody for listening. Thank you. Goodbye.